The Americans were led by George Smith Patton, Jr., and Patton had been born on the 11th of November in 1885, the same year the Statue of Liberty arrived in New York Harbor from France, and the Statue of Liberty was dedicated with the first-ever ticker tape parade on the 28th of October in New York City. It would become obvious on day one of Operation Torch that the British could not control the Americans, but not for want of trying, and Churchill had hoped that the threat of America coming into the war would have compelled Hitler to quickly make terms, and when the Americans did make it ashore in North Africa, Churchill desperately needed Hitler's help to stop the Americans, but within a year it would be found out that even with the best clandestine assistance from the British, the Third Reich would not be able to stop the Americans either. When the British reported that Rommel had withdrawn from El Alamein on the 11th of November on Patton's birthday in 1942, Stalin launched his Russian counteroffensive toward Stalingrad the following week on the 19th of November, trapping the Germans four days later in a complete pincer encirclement and the Germans at Stalingrad would surrender on the 31st of January in 1943 after an airlift was attempted for 70 days to rescue Paulus, but had failed for lack of fuel, even though the Luftwaffe had enough transport planes to have gotten the job done. Kesselring was the Luftwaffe field marshal in North Africa and had been terribly disappointed to see his airstrips being lost to the British, and he'd been short on planes and fuel while the British gained air superiority in North Africa, and after El Alamein, Rama was ordered to Tunisia, where he was shocked to see such a large build-up of German forces being prepared to fight the Americans. The supplies that had been denied to Rommel at El Alamein were now given to him so he could lead the attack on the Americans at Kasserine Pass. But it was to be Rommel's last victory in Hitler's war, and command of North Africa was given back to the Italians as soon as the Americans appeared to be defeated at Kasserine Pass in February, and Rommel was ordered to remain there as subordinate to the Italians. When Rommel attacked the British on the 6th of March in 1943, Monty had been aware of all Rommel's plans in advance, and Rommel was ambushed and lost 50 tanks and was ordered back to Germany on the 9th of March for a debriefing with Hitler. And then Rommel's men would surrender in May into the care of the British in North Africa. Rommel was sent to Greece in July of 1943 to keep out the Russians but was ordered back to Berlin that same day because Mussolini had just been ousted and Rommel was now to go to Italy on the 16th of August. But the Italians made peace with the Americans instead on the 8th of September, so Rommel was put in charge of taking all the Italians' guns away. Kesselring and Rommel were ordered to Berlin on the 30th of September, where Kesselring told Hitler that the Germans could hold a line to the south of Rome, while Rommel said they could hold a line north of Rome. But Hitler was interested in finding the Pope's gold, so Hitler made Kesselring the commander in Italy and sent Rommel to France to get ready to stop the Americans in the British Operation Overlord the following spring. When Omar Nelson Bradley arrived in London to prepare for Overlord, there were already 20 divisions of American soldiers camped out in England, and when Bradley tried to check into a hotel, he was told he was not welcome. And when Bradley set up his headquarters in an old school in London, the British rang the city's church bells for the first time since 1940, the bells used to signal that the English beaches had been invaded by the enemy. The British told Bradley they were just ringing the bells to celebrate a British victory in Sicily, and Bradley had just come fresh from the Sicilian campaign where he'd gotten so fed up with British bombing raids missing their targets in Sicily at the expense of Americans that on the 5th of August in 1943 Bradley had had the Americans drop their ordnance squarely on Monty's headquarters. After that, Bradley had the Americans set 33,000 Sicilian POWs free to go home to their families because it was harvest time 
and the grain and grape crops required working men, and twenty per cent of the American soldiers had been Italians themselves. The British were unhappy when Bradley brought his own staff to London instead of using British advisers, but Bradley ignored their dismay because he'd been a boiler maker before attending West Point, and after setting up his headquarters in England, Bradley flew back to America to personally pick out the officers he would need for his staff during Overlord. While in America, Bradley went to Omaha with General George Marshall, who was speaking at an American Legion convention, and FDR asked Bradley to stop in to say hello. Marshall had fought in the Great War, and his roommate on the ship over to France had been Leslie James McNair, and FDR told Bradley all about the Manhattan Project, and warned him that the Germans might drop an atom bomb on the Americans at any time after D-Day. After those two weeks of vacation, Bradley headed back to England, but before leaving, he went with his wife to New York City to see the musical Oklahoma on Broadway. Bradley asked Monty if the British would please supply one seventeen-pounder anti-tank gun for each U.S. tank platoon, and Monty said that British supply was overloaded with British orders, and Bradley asked Monty to give the Americans just a few seventeen-pounders they could tow, and Monty said they were in too short supply to spare, so Bradley had the Americans bring in several battalions of 90 millimeter anti-aircraft guns that could be pointed down to the ground toward the enemy tanks, and the Americans told Monty that they were difficult to maneuver and were needed as a defensive weapon against German panzers while London was being buzz-bombed with V-1s. The relationship never improved between the British and American officers, although Dwight David Eisenhower made a superhuman effort to make that happen, and Ike's biggest problem would not be the supplies or the weather or the Russians making a separate peace with Hitler, but was the constant threat of the British making a separate peace with Germany, and that would have left the American soldiers stranded in a foreign land whose language they did not speak, completely outnumbered by a thoroughly competent and implacable enemy. On D-Day at 6.45 a.m., the German radio reported that the British had landed and had almost made it all the way to the city of Caen, and that the Americans had been smashed at Omaha Beach, and at 1.35 p.m., the German radio said that the Americans had been thrown back into the sea, and when confronted with reports to the contrary, Monty's radio room allowed Ike's messages to get through again. By 6 p.m., Rommel reported that the British reports were false and that the Americans were coming ashore in strength, and Rommel ordered every German in France under his command to move towards the American beaches, while Monty carefully separated his British troops from the Americans. The landing craft carrying the Americans towards Utah Beach had caught a current that took them 2,000 yards south of their landing zone where there were fewer Germans waiting for them, so Utah Beach suffered less than 200 casualties, and they were able to go inland four miles and make contact with the American 101st Airborne. Only 10% of the 101st paratroopers had been dropped in their intended zones, which mightily confused the Germans, who were unprepared to see so many Americans arrive where they were not supposed to be. On Omaha Beach, most of the naval bombardment had missed the Germans dug in on the heights, who were waiting there to attack them, and by noon, when the, America, when the enemy began to run out of ammunition, the Americans were able to move forward off the beaches. The British were landing on Gold Beach and had been offloaded directly onto shore or close to shore rather than further out as the Americans had been forced to do, and the British made contact with the Canadians who were landing on Juneau Beach and had suffered 1,000 casualties in disembarking and by nightfall the Gold and Juneau beachheads were 12 miles wide and 7 miles deep. Much of the opening opening artillery on D-Day had either been off-target or not concentrated enough to have had any impact against the Germans, and the specialized armor providing artillery support worked on the British beaches but not on Omaha. 
The British on Sword Beach went safely inland to within a few miles of Con for their Operation Perch, and it would take until the 13th of June for the confusion of Perch to die down after over 4,000 men had died on the Normandy beaches, with 10,000 of them wounded, and at the same time the Germans lost 1,000 men. The Americans laid huge steel mats on the sand for traction while Flotsam still washed up on the beach with every tide, and the American brass sat on the beach eating sea rations and biscuits while they discussed the war. No Germans had counterattacked yet, but twice some German tanks had approached Monty's command post, but no shots were fired. The plan for Overlord gave Monty complete command and control over all the ground forces in the Normandy theater, while Ike back in London was the supreme commander, and that meant the Americans would be under Monty's command until the agreed-upon date of the 1st of September, when the American soldiers would revert to an American commander, rather than having Monty issuing orders. With this structure, Ike was not quite in command as the supreme commander because he had to answer to an allied command board in Britain called Schaefe, and until the 1st of September, Monty was given authority over all the American troops as long as he pretended to have interpreted Ike's wishes correctly, which began as a bad situation that would quickly get worse.' 